Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 226, Holiday Gaming with Family. I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your holiday game nights better. We record live on Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern on Twitch, and you should stop by and join us sometime and catch the sausage making that goes into these episodes. So this episode was a little lighter on the sausage, and I go ahead and warn you, we're not going to be here next week. We'll throw that in right here because we're asking people to join us, and I don't want them to join next week. But we'll be here on the 27th. So it is the season, and we are sticking with the holiday theme tonight with a question about holiday game nights with family. We've got some tips for playing games together during the holidays and list some of our favorite games for playing with our own families. Then we have a review of a Christmas-themed escape room game, The Kringle Caper, from Grand Gamers Guild. We wrap up with our usual week in review, where I've got some more thoughts on Bah Humbug on the, and the 12 Days of Christmas and more. We mention a lot of different things in each episode, and you can find links to most of it through our show notes at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 226. That's 226. Now, yes, some links will be affiliate links, but these cost you nothing to use, but help support us. Now, finally, some games discussed tonight will be review copies that we received from publishers. Well, let's get started with a stop by the mailroom. Welcome to this week's Suggestion Box. Here we share some of the feedback we've gotten in the last few weeks. Now, first up, a comment from DeadRat117 on our Black Rim 1876 review. They write, awesome review. Thank you. I just ordered this to play with my wife as she is very interested in the Victorian era. Can you recommend any similar games? Well, first up, uh, thanks for the comment and the praise. You're welcome uh, for doing that review. Uh, now, I don't know of any other Victorian era escape room in a box games. I'm sorry about that. I, I even Googled it to see if there's some out there, a checkboard game geek. I, I didn't see anything else like that. Now, that said, I will recommend La Famiglia series. That's from the same company, Puzzling Pursuits, that did Black Brim. And to be fair, uh, though the setting was different, we actually preferred La Famiglia to Black Brim. It was just a little more engaging, and it felt more realistic than, than the other one. It felt like we were actually handling, you know, mafia codes being passed back and forth. Now, from there, though, there are tons of options uh, you can go for really over-the-top component quality games with longer play length, with with all kinds of like physical artifacts you get and and really neat bits. Check out Mysterious Package Company. They've got some really over-the-top like eight-plus-hour game um, escape room game experiences. And if you do go to Mysterious Package Company, uh, we are an affiliate, and please use our code Bellhop to save ten percent off. Now, for something more puzzly and more game-like. Uh, Black Prim kind of fits this. It's a lot of puzzles instead of like solving the crime. Check out the Coded Chronicle series from our friends at the Op. Uh, the Scooby Doo one was fantastic, extremely well done, and we all enjoyed that. Especially if you've got family members joining in. We also love the Goonies one as well. Though I do have to warn you, please skip the Shining as it has some issues. Next, another recommendation would be the Exit series of games from Cosmos. These are all under twenty bucks each and come in a variety of difficulty levels. Um, what these are is a lot more hands-on, a lot more physical and physicality than Black Brim, and they are also a lot of fun. Finally, we're going to call out another one of our affiliates, and that is Grand Gamers Guild, and take a look at their Holiday Hijinks series. These are small, cheap card packs that feature one-hour holiday-themed escape rooms. You can use Bellhop there, too, the code B-E-L-L-H-O-P to save 10%. Now, if you want to hear more about these, just stay tuned because we're going to be reviewing one of them tonight. Well, next up, we wanted to share some great feedback on our two-part topic of miniatures in board games. These feature some further fantasy game recommendations and a possible new-to-episode topic. <laughs> now, first up, we have Owen Gorman, who writes, I think Mythic Battles Pantheon was the craziest haul of miniatures I've ever gotten in a board game. <laughs> the board game would get a 6 out of 10 from me, but the sheer quantity, detail, and sturdiness of the miniatures makes it a 10 out of 10 in that department. Nice. For about $220 Canadian, I received almost 80 miniatures, with about 30% of those being large size or greater and gargantuan too. Mm. Pretty gate game for minis. Next, we have Set1106, who says, if you want to paint minis, skip the board games and go for sprues. Board games typically use pre-assembled soft plastic 
and have a lot of prep, meaning mold lines and gap filling. Sprues, where you cut out and assemble the miniatures, have less prep. RPGs and miniature skirmish games require miniatures, and you'll want terrain. I'm sure Tabletop Bellhop could create an episode or series to help mm-hmm. board gamers add miniature gaming to their hobby list. Also, Simon's first massive darkness Kickstarter was an incredible selection of good fantasy miniatures for all sorts of gamings. However, I haven't seen one as good since. Mm-hmm. Reaper and Archon Kickstarters are goodish places to start. I would recommend picking up a miniatures skirmish game that mostly fits your current selection of miniatures or RPG, and then looking for miniature Kickstarters that fill out your collection. Not cheap, especially if you paint, but highly immersive. Oh, well, there's a recommendation in there for an episode or series. I don't think we do a series, but perhaps an episode. Um, Getting board gamers into the miniature gaming hobby. I could see that. Um, I've added it to our question list. Um, I can already think of some good advice for that. So I got to say, it's been a long time since I would consider myself a miniature painter or a miniature gamer. I'm definitely more of a board gamer now. But I do have some experience in that area, and I know lots of local gamers I could also source for information on that. Maybe this is the one we'll get, like, uh, too much coffee painting on the show and do our first uh, Ask an Expert episode. But that is something for the new year. I don't know. I I might feel guilty if we start getting board gamers into miniatures. That's an (laughs) expensive hobby. And that's going to be talking about $220 board games. Yeah. But next we have Jason Wallace, who simply stated... What about God Tier? Some great minis there. And finally, we have Benny Sixtoes, who didn't have a suggestion for us, but commented, I don't think one is better than the other. I think whether one is preferable is highly dependent on the specific game we're talking about. But I've come to really appreciate acrylic standees in recent years. It yep. seems a nice middle ground, and they generally look great. I, I got to agree with you, Benny. I do dig the, uh, the the acrylic standees. We were talking about that during the full episode. Check out the full episode for our whole discussion on what we think is better, minis or miniatures. Our meeples, sorry, not minis or miniatures. Meeples or miniatures. I had a side note, sausage making. I screwed that up when I gave Gwen, my daughter, to, to do our thumbnails. I said minis versus miniatures. She's like, no, 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 not minis <laughs> versus miniatures. Sorry, it's supposed to be meeples versus miniatures. Anyway. Um, I do dig, dig the standees. Well, thank all of you for the constructive comments. There were quite a few games that were mentioned there. So what I'll do is I'll toss them into the show notes that Sean called out earlier. Well, that's all for this week. Thank you to everyone who comments, shares, and interacts with our stuff. Well, we did warn you that it is the season of unexpected cancellations, though a broken tooth and emergency surgery wasn't exactly what I expected to be the reason. Oh, at least it's not my eyes this year in the holiday season. It's usually me that somehow gets injured or needs to go to the hospital this time of year. And I I knock on wood that that doesn't happen this year. So I am sorry to say that we are going to have to cancel next week. We're going to take next week off um, and we won't be hosting another live show until December 27th. Um, So we won't be here on the 20th. We will be back on the 27th. Um, after Christmas here, and that episode won't go live until the new year. So I just realized that tonight when I was getting things set up just before we went live. So what you can probably expect that show to be is our yearly recap where we looked at our most played games, our biggest surprises, and all the usual things you expect from a podcast at the end of the year or start of the year. As while it might be amusing to watch a medically compromised host of the show, <laughs> I expect it would make poor content in the long term. Yeah, it's surgery, tooth extractions. I, I, I recovering that quickly would be surprising. I, mean, I am sure you were beyond painkillers for a while. <laughs> we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions tonight. The question comes from Ross, aka More Games, please. Who asked, "What board game do you most enjoy playing with your parents or family?" Looking for holiday recommendations. So originally, I had planned to break this question into two specific topics uh, that are related and start off tonight by talking about gaming with family and offering some advice for doing so. And then following up next week with a list of games that are great for playing with family during the holidays, which would include the games Sean and I love playing with our particular family. But with us no longer having another episode before Christmas, I figure we might as well combine both of these into one longer topic tonight. And due to that, we are only going to have one review later in the show. So settle in, maybe a nice warm cup of cocoa, and get ready for holiday game talk. 
So what I do want to start with is those tips and tricks. I, I want to spend a bit of time sharing some things we've learned over the years for making a family game night successful, to, to, to make things go over well with your family. Now, this advice is tailored to family game night, as that's what Ross's question asked. But pretty much all of this applies to any holiday gathering with friends, family, co-workers, or really any event that's going to have a mix of hobby gamers, casual gamers, and non-gamers. Right. Um, like as soon as I read playing game with parents or families, um, I felt it was implied, and I hope I'm not wrong here, um, that meant parents or family who aren't gamers, or at least parents and family who aren't familiar with most of the hobby games that we talk about on our show, and which I assume most of our listeners are more familiar with. This means not only may they not used to be uh, be used to the complexity of hobby games, but they may simply be not interested in taking the time for them amidst all the holiday hustle and bustle. So we're going to start with some generic tips. So this is just if you're getting together with your family for the holidays and you're heading over for the big Christmas party, the New Year's party, the the uh, uh, do you have Hanukkah parties? I apologize. I, I was raised with North American, um, Christian, Catholic, Christmas and everything went with it um, with some Orthodox um, Ukrainian thrown in there. Things like some of my, my friends and relatives didn't get their gifts to Little Christmas. Um, so I do apologize for my lack of knowledge of other holiday traditions. But whatever that gathering happens to be, these are some tips and tricks to try to get some gaming involved. Now, one of the big things here is bring games. You yep. want to play games, but don't expect to play games. Not everyone may match your idea of what you're going to be doing on those holiday, uh, at that holiday event. Yeah. The whole thing here is it, like me, if, if you can ask ahead of time, right? The best way to do it is, Hey, do you mind if I bring some games that may or may not? Cause some people are, might immediately think, Oh yeah. One of his, you know, they were over, you know, uh, during the spring and you brought out twilight Imperium and everyone's eyes glossed over and like, Oh, we don't want that. Right. Like, no, no, I'm going to bring some light, light party games. I'm just going to bring some games. that will be fun. Or what I would do is I would just pack them in the trunk and not walk in the door with a huge pile of games. And that's actually another tip is don't show up with a ton of games. Just show up with a small selection. And like I said, leave them in the trunk, leave them in the car, pack them somewhere. And then, you know, if there's a time during the night where, you know, everyone's done eating and things seem to be slowing down. You're like, hey, does everyone want to play a game? I happen to have some out in the car. I'll go grab them. Now, if you are your family already has some gaming traditions, that's a different story. Heck, they may already be ready for you when you walk in the door. But, Very true. But again, with family, there's a lot of other people. You know, families expand all the time. So while it may be a, a family tradition that you all sit around and play Twilight Imperium every <laughs> Christmas... <laughs> If there are new members of the family, whether they've been married in, born in, grown up, whatever it may be, don't force anyone to join in your traditions. Suggest yes. it, encourage them to play, but don't be pushy about it. Yeah, you don't want to force anyone to play who doesn't want to play. This is the same tip we always give. Parents are like, how do I raise my kids to be gamers? And I'm like, don't force it on them. The, the biggest way to turn people away from this hobby is to force them to do something that they don't expect to enjoy or aren't going to enjoy. You want enthusiastic consent. You want people who want to sit down and play games. And to that end, you're going to need to sell them on the games before they sit down. But if someone's like, mm, I just don't feel like playing games, don't. Yeah, you can do maybe one. Ah, come on, just play. But don't keep pushing. Don't be that person that's trying to trying to make everyone else have fun. It rarely works out. Yeah, there may be some people in the group who are just those negative Nancys or Nellies who who just always say no to everything and need a little bit of pushing. But if you know that, if you know if the family understands that dynamic, that's one thing. But generally, if someone isn't interested, let them not be interested because yeah. that's okay too. Now, another thing is you don't have to get everyone to play. This is important. If you've got twelve people at your event, you don't necessarily have to have a twelve-player game. Now, this will be a good way to weed out those people who don't want to play, right? When you do say, hey, everyone, everyone want to play a game and three people are like, no, not really. Well, maybe the rest of you can still play a game. But you don't have to cater to everyone at once. You don't have to bring these massive high player count games. And there are some great ones out there, but they're not always the best game. Like 
type of games you're looking for here are probably, which I'm kind of jumping ahead a bit, is you want social games where people get to hang out. You get too many people involved and that may actually fall apart. So not everyone has to play the games and more so not everyone has to play the same game. If you bring multiple games, you can break into groups. Everyone can sit there and do their own little thing in their own table. It depends on your physical space, of course, and lots of other little considerations. But don't force people to play. Not everyone has to play. And if you do have a ton of people playing, you don't have to play the same game. Yeah, one of the things that happens a lot during these holidays, especially uh, almost regardless of your tradition, is cooking and eating. And now the mm -hmm. people who are cooking, if you're, you know, if you're going to a Christmas dinner and, you know, you've got three people who are in and out of the kitchen constantly think they may want to play the game, but you also need to make sure that they're involved in a game that has the ability to sort of pause and break up like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas there might be some other people who want to sit down and, you know, just stay out of the way until dinner's done because they've learned that walking into the kitchen at that wrong time is a bad thing or whatever yeah. the, uh, the issue may be. So having a couple of options there can be a great thing that way too. Now, the other thing too is uh, I kind of mentioned, but don't bring too much because you don't want to give people too many choices. And honestly, to be fair, you don't want to give people many choices at all. Because if you have a group of people, I think everyone's gone through this. The more people you have, the more difficulty you're going to have settling on a choice. You are much better off maybe bringing three games, but only presenting one or two at a time going, hey, everyone, we just had dinner. We're all laughing. We're, we're, the drinks are starting to flow. Let's get together and play a game of just one. It's this really quick to play. I can explain it in 10 seconds. You just need a dry erase marker. And you know what? We won't even use those. We'll leave them in the box. Just need paper and pencils. And I'll teach you how to play. And that's it. You just present it that way. And then if enough people say no, maybe you present something else or you do the other go, hey, I've got this copy of Point Salad and I've got this other card game. Uh, I've, I've got the great Del Moody. This one, you're sitting there and you're building an engine doing this. This one's more of a gamer's game. And then this one, you've got a special deck of cards and you're trying to do this. And it's more silly. Would you prefer this or this? And then don't leave it open for or something else. Just do you, would you prefer this or this? Try to limit the the number of suggestions, the number of options, sorry, the number of options when presenting games at an event like that. It's just like asking if someone wants, where does someone wants to go out for dinner? If you yeah. say, do you want to eat pizza or Chinese? You might get a decision. If you just say, where would you like to eat? You could mm -hmm. still be there for hours later. Now, speaking of eating, Gaming and eating are two separate things. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this on the show many, many times, but especially around the holidays, there's always lots of finger foods and treats and chocolates, chocolates that melt on your fingers and can get all over cards, never to be extricated again. Uh, you want to mark your playing cards? Start eating some chocolates and then playing with them. That'll mark your cards for good. Yeah, dips. Dips are also bad. <laughs> People, no matter how careful you are, drip, dips drip. Um, so so the big thing here is we're not saying don't eat and game. We're just saying don't do them together. Now, in general, I say everyone eat first and then you go play a game and then maybe take a break and have a snack and really separate it. That's what I prefer to do. We or you're gaming, you take a break to eat and then you go back to gaming. But I get that people like snacks at the game table. The thing is, is try to separate them in the fact that the snacks are somewhere else. So like if you have your kitchen table with your game set up on it and then you have the snacks maybe in the kitchen or on an island. So you have to go away from the game table, go over, have a couple snacks and then come back. There's better chance people are going to do things like wipe their fingers and clean them and so on. Um, the other thing you can do is on the game side is make sure to protect your games because no matter how how much you separate it, Someone's probably going to go come in with something, a Timbit that they picked up on the way in, or they're going to have their coffee in their hand and something's going to spill. So also be sure to protect your games. But you really, you don't want the bowl of dip in the center of the table sitting next to the Catan board. Now, another thing that goes with eating is drinking. I don't want to get into the details of the merits and detriments of drinking, but be aware that once people are consuming alcohol during a game night, have some plan for that. Uh, make sure people have rides home and all the usual stuff, but also plan the games you are going to play accordingly and be even more prepared for things like spills, bumps and things getting lost. And uh, as I mentioned in our chat room, a roll of paper towels sitting on the table does definitely make some strong suggestions as to keeping clean yes. and cleaning up. Pro tip. This is one that I didn't even think of that I had someone point out after a few of our New Year's events. 
Let everyone know where the garbage is and provide extra garbage bags around the room. So that was something I didn't even realize we were doing. We have one spot to put garbage in our game room, and it's a little kind of polo drawer that's not easy to access except from one part of the room. And someone's like, for one, I've been coming to your house for years. I didn't know where the garbage was, so I was just kind of made a little pile and stuff, stuffed it in like, you know, on the corner of the table. And I've had other friends that are like, man, just so now we put out some extra bags on the end of TV trays, right? That way people have a place to put their garbage or else it will build up on the table. All right. You have anything else for generic kind of tips to, to get things going? Uh, I think the real big thing is understand the vibe. Uh, if there are people cooking, you know, if the kitchen is off limits, you know, if if great grandmama runs the kitchen like a, uh, you know, like a, a army barracks and everyone knows that, you know, if you go in there, you're going to either be drafted into cooking <laughs> or kicked out. Just, you know, don't try and set up a game at the, the kitchen table, even if there's space, yes. uh, you know. Make use of the available space. Don't uh, open up or use space that is uh, already pre-assigned to other duties. Fair enough. And actually, that kind of fits in with what I want to talk about next, which is what kinds of games should you bring to an event like this? And one of the things you're going to need to know ahead of time, and maybe you don't, maybe you are going to Aunt Judy's house for the first time, or you have a rotating Christmas Eve party that's at a different relative's every year, or you've been invited to a stranger's house that you've never been to before, um, or your new significant other, you're going to meet their family for the first time. You don't know the space, but it's going to be a little more difficult. But if you can... Plan the games and what you're bringing and what you ex and your expectations on the space you're going to. Now, one of the things to be aware of, though, is don't count on having space to play games. This is the reason games like charades are so popular. They don't need a table and they don't need everyone sitting at the table. Games like um, the one I mentioned, Monstrosities one, um, Just One's another one. Games that don't require a table are probably a good idea. Like have them as a backup plan. Because you can't count on having that beautiful kitchen table you saw when you were over for drinks two weeks ago because it's, it might be covered in food or it might be covered in presents or it might just be decorated for the holidays or it might have a Christmas village on it. Even games like Psychobab, which are great group games, take up just enough to space that you can't set it up on a, on a, uh, you know, on a, on a little folding TV tray. Uh, that, cause that may be all the space you're able to get, you know, I, you know, a, a center place to throw your cards. If you're playing a trick taker, you can probably mm -hmm. manage to find something like that, but, uh, don't expect necessarily all that much more. Now you could always, if you got like a minivan, like me, throw a card table in the back, that might be a bonus or that, that could be an extra thing you could bring along. I know my parents used to do that back in the day. My dad had a card table in the back of uh, his old Lincoln. And sometimes we go to parties and be like, you want to play cards? Because that's my parents were all about playing cards, traditional playing card games. And be like, oh, no table, no problem. And he'd go get his table out of the back. So it just kind of goes, these tips have been going on for generations here. Uh, other things to be aware of is lighting. Most hobby board games need pretty good light. Most party games, thankfully, aren't as uh, light specific. But as we've learned, even... Light card games like, say, The Deadlies, which is kind of like Uno for gamers. Like, if your family likes Uno, bring The Deadlies. There's there's one of our game recommendations tonight. Can be harder to play depending on the lighting you are in. Um, generally, Christmas dinner's well lit, but then once the dinner's done, people like to turn the lights down. Seating is important. Try to see if you can find games that can be playing standing versus seated, or more importantly, some people seated, some people standing. Co-op games are generally good for this, where people can work together and collaborate. That also works well for when people can leave the room and come back in. So any type of like detective game or something like that, or a, a cooperative, even Shadows uh, over Camelot, where like you can jump in and take a turn and then leave and other people can do things and you don't have to come back to another. And that's also when, well, it's your turn, you can sit down and take your turn and then give up the seat for someone else. Another uh, nice tip is pay attention to how much uh, visual acuity is required. This goes all I was thinking about with the lighting. Uh, mm -hmm. If you've got games with really little text on those cards that you have to you have to read that not only requires good lights, but good eyesight to see what's on these cards. It may yes. seem like it's a it's a pretty simple trick taker or something. But then there's that little extra bit of, of text that you need to read on those cards. 
And that may put some people off, depending on on visual acuity of those at the the table. Uh, you don't you don't necessarily have to be uh, a, a blind meeple like uh, Ryan to really struggle yeah. with uh, you know playing some trick takers and other card games that would otherwise just be a nice simple friendly card game. No, I totally legit. I am sure at some point, if my kids started having friends over for for family game night. I have a feeling I might be the, the the old dad who can't see the cards anymore. Now, another one to watch is uh, time limits. Um, for one, you don't want to do games. Uh, uh, props to Red Meeple Ryan for this one. You don't want to do games with lengthy setup and teardown, especially if you're gaming prior to a meal. Uh, a lot of non-gamers are not going to account for how long it takes to clean up a game. They are expecting you to take the Monopoly box and sweep everything in. If you've got your custom box insert where everything goes into the right spot, when they're like, oh, turkey's ready and your game's still out on the table, that can be a problem. Um, also be aware of how much time you have. Like, how long is the event running? Uh, are you eating? What is the plans after dinner? Um, how long are people expecting to stay afterwards? How long is the host willing to have people at their place? And all of that. So be aware of time limits. And this is where, if you don't know better, the shorter, the better. The, the short, quick, rapid fire games. Games like we mentioned already, but Psycho Babble where one round is extremely quick. Yeah, the full game could take a while. Monstrosity is another one. The full game takes a while, but you don't have to play the full game. Concept is another one where you can basically, you finish around, you can pack it up at any time. That's the best thing to do if you don't know your time limits. But then if you do know, it's like, hey, we're getting together, we're watching the game, and then we're going to eat. And then people are willing to stay overnight if they want. You can crash on the couch. Maybe this is the perfect event to bring out your Twilight Imperium as long as everyone's agreed to it ahead of time, don't surprise people with Twilight Imperium. And especially be aware if you have a large family. I know I've been involved in family gatherings where there are rental locations being used. Mm -hmm. uh, your 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 family is, you know goes down to the curling club and has their Christmas your your oh. their giant Christmas party there. Uh, when that when you are out of time, when your rental is up, you need to vacate the premises, not start cleaning up. Yeah. Uh, so be aware of things like that if you are using external locations and not someone's house. Now, the other one, of course, uh, watch the player count. Personally, in those big events like that, I think what you're going to want to bring is like two player, four player games. And you're never going to get everyone playing, but you might get the people at your table playing. Right. So the big family gathering events where they do rent out a hall. I've been to a couple of these. Um, heck, we've done it at a wedding where you just grab the people at your table and get them to play a game. So you have two player games. Like if it's me and my wife going to the event, that way Dan and I can play something while everyone else is dancing or whatever you have going on. Or you bring other ones. Now, um, now if you know your event's 18 people, again, I don't, I don't recommend trying to find an 18 player game. Maybe it'll work. You take code names, break into two tape, uh, groups of nine, or you do uh, something where everyone can take part, which is a little difficult. Um, code names is an, or not code names. Uh, concepts an example of that. But in that case, you want to buy the big mat. There's like a giant mat you can get for co for for concepts so people can see it. But be aware of the player counts. And again, don't be afraid to break people up. Like if everyone knows there's going to be gaming after dinner, that's the best group to break people up because they know there's going to be gaming. And they're probably expecting some everyone's got to play together. And we're probably going to play something like Werewolf because it's only playing that plays 18 people. Surprise them with three six player games. And I bet you everyone will have a better time than they would have had. Um, except for the person who wins werewolf and like the two that are left at the end, everyone else probably had a better time playing the other six player games. Also be aware that sometimes it's okay to have a two player game. Maybe it's just yeah. you and your cousin who you only ever see on Christmas who happens to also be a gamer. And you guys yep. have the ability without angering the rest of your family to go off into a corner and play a couple of really great mm -hmm. games. Go for it. Maybe you guys can communicate in advance and figure out a way to your game, play a little medium weight game that doesn't take up too much space or time. Uh, and that could be okay. Maybe the rest of the family is going to go off and, and play whatever it is they like to play or just sit and talk and not play any games at all, which is also okay. And to be fair, when I was growing up, that game was Talisman and the other player was my cousin, John. Every family Christmas party the Sue Year family Christmas on my mom's side of the family, John and I would find a table somewhere or the floor, um, often in like a bedroom floor or on a bed. We've done that too. And we would play our yearly game of talisman. Um, the interesting one about that is my two cousins, Matt and Jason, eventually who 
who when we were first playing it, they were too old and too cool for for toy looking board games. But then as they got older, started joining us and like playing talisman on at, at my family Christmas party was a thing for a while there. And then the other the adults, I don't even know what they're doing. They're probably playing traditional card games with my parents or they were watching the game because there's usually some game on of some form of sports or another at every family event I've been to. Or they're watching Christmas movies. So that was another tradition, watching Christmas movies. Now, another thing to watch out for is components. Now, we talked about hard to set up, tough to, you know, long to set up and things like that. But even if it's easy to set up, if there are a ton of little pieces, do you really want to have to go through Aunt Mildred's shag carpeting to try and <laughs> find those pieces when they hit the floor? Yeah, with a large group of people, too, and people who are not familiar with hobby games, they may not realize where to put things, how to hold things, how to stack them, um, and, and things get knocked. And I hate to say it, but the average person doesn't think of games having much value um, and think nothing of some cards falling on the floor and just like scooping them up with a, the broom and dustpan. And and people don't realize how expensive um, hobby board games can be and things like cards get bent. Um, again, I say if you can protect your cards, right? Sleeve your cards. Um, do some things to protect them, but just parties are not a great place for anything with lots of small pieces. Um, I learned this as a small child, opening up Lego kits before getting home or model kits. Uh, the same goes for your games. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of those things where people really do think about the whole sweeping into the box like like Monopoly. Uh, there yeah. may be a couple of games, older families who have played the, the game of life. There was actually a little bit of box organization in those original games of life with, with glass jars for things. But for the most part, games just shoved back in the box. And that's yeah. what people are used to. And, and that same level of treatment of the pieces, not even just putting it away, but the treatment of it was a matter of, you know, sweep it away. It's, yeah. it's just a throwaway, you know, $10 it's, card, it's, $10 it's box of games. $10 board game. Now, the other thing to watch for is the game weight. This you're going to base on who you're playing, right? If, if your family is a bunch of gamers, great. Go with whatever types of games you enjoy. But if you've got uncles, cousins, young kids, whatever, you want to stick to games that are easy to teach, quick to understand. You need to catch people's attention and get them playing like in under five minutes and, and probably less than that. Like, like five's long. Five minutes to explain a game to someone sitting at Uncle Jerry's and they don't kind of don't really want to be there and they're stuffed, they're full, they've eaten a lot of food. Five minutes is a very long time. You want quick to explain, quick to get engaged. Now, you don't necessarily have to teach the whole game, right? We've done episodes on how to teach games and everything like that. The best thing is something you can jump into right of the way. This is where the cooperative games work, right? You don't have to explain pandemic to people. You could just set up the board, have it going. And then it's your go. Here are your cards. Here's what we have to do. I suggest you go here. Like you can kind of jump right into them. That's when those games work out, the, the heavier games. Again, Shadows Over Camelot's a great hidden trader game. And you can jump in. You just get people play for your cards and then it, walk them through it. Have someone moderate so you can look at their hands and be like, look, you can go over here. You can go over here. You want to try to do this. You want to try to stop that. Um, I know there's other games. These are just the ones that keep popping into my head for whatever reason. But get those games, watch the heavy weight, try to stick with lower weight and easy, quick to explain. They said less than five minutes, like as, as short as possible. The deadlies, I have everyone hand out their cards. I tell everyone what the different suits do and I just say go. And I'll do the, try not to do the, well, don't, don't worry, it's not as complicated as it seems. That's just going to scare people away. One of the things I would say is, first off, know your games, but you should always know your games if you're going to be teaching other people anyway. But if you have to take out a rule book, whether it's for learning the setup or counting the pieces or whatever, you're probably going to lose people right there. Yeah. If the rule book comes out, especially if it's, even if you don't need, even if you don't need it, except to, to, to check a couple of things, if you pull out a big, thick rule book, you're going to turn people off. People are going to go, uh, you know what? Maybe not. Yeah. Uh, so if you can leave the rule book in the box, you're a mile ahead of where you would be otherwise. Yeah, totally agree. So what are some other things to watch for, for what types of games you're going to bring? Again, don't bring too many. Cater it to the group. Uh, another thing, too, is like if you know your family's into a licensed game, that is a great way to get people invested. 
is to bring a game based on that license. You know, if everyone um, got together and watched the Doctor Who Christmas special and then bring some kind of, you know, bring Time of the Daleks or bring, if, if you want lighter, bring Doctor Who Yahtzee. It's still Yahtzee, but at least it has that theme that's going to get people engaged. Although if you now, have the Doctor Who Yahtzee TARDIS, please put some felt on the inside. That game is so incredibly uh, loud. <laughs> yeah, there's something else. There's there's something else to be aware of is um you don't want to bother other people. So, you know, while Happy Salmon might seem like the perfect game to get everyone um, having a good time and playing together. And it's something you can play standing up, which is great. Depending on what else is going on, if if there's a group of people just trying to have a nice conversation and catch up because they haven't seen each other in 12 months, they don't want to be having their conversation next to a table playing Happy Salmon. Now, one other little awkward one, but I think it's worth touching on in this day and age. There are a lot of people getting together at holidays, and they don't necessarily always agree with each other. So mm -hmm. try to avoid games that lean in certain directions. Mo was mentioning Pandemic earlier. Well, if you've got yeah. anti-vaxxer aunts and uncles, that may not be the right choice. Uh, you know, there are certain games that encourage discussions about certain topics, which you may not want to bring to your family event because of people you know will be there. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it may be a great game and you may not agree or care what whoever your fa that family member is, but it's the holidays. There's no reason to go around starting fights if you don't need to. Another one to watch, too, is age. Recommended ages for games. Family gatherings tend to have multiple generations of people gathering together. That's part of what's so awesome about them. So when you are picking out what games to bring, either bring games for different age groups, like have Animal Upon Animal with you. Because that'll play everyone, actually. So that's, that's actually a good example of just a game you can bring for any age limit. But maybe bring a copy of Vivo Topo or some other kid's game, Monza, if you happen to have it, or something really light for the kids to play. And then heavier games for the grown-ups to play. Or better yet, games that where you can all play together. Dexterity games are great for this. Dexterity games tend to work for any age limit. Not everyone loves dexterity games. It, it might be a hard sell. And again, if someone says, no, nah, that's not for me, have them not play. Don't, don't be surprised that, that person says, hey, it's not for me, then watches you guys playing and have a great time and asks to join in later. Definitely had that happen. Um, Dexterity games are great for that. Animal Upon Animal. There's even a Christmas themed one, so you can even keep it thematic. Um, toss that in there. Go Cuckoo. Um, there's another great one. You know, yep. Go Cuckoo is one of those things where everyone will look at it and say, oh, we're going to play Pickup Sticks. And you say, no, not quite. This is a twist. Because everyone knows pickup sticks, and this is yeah. just, a, a, and that's a great way to actually introduce people to this fun game that mm -hmm. takes up a little bit of space, but isn't too bad. You can set that on a, on a uh, card table or a coffee, little uh, little folding uh, TV tray, and uh, go to town. All right, uh, and then one tip from the chat from Eggman Junior, which I agree is okay. Feel free, bring more games. Just don't present too many at once. Maybe keep them in the trunk, right? And then you can go get them. Uh, this is a good one for the heavier weight games. Like maybe you show up and you're like, oh, do you guys want to play a game? And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. I'll play a game. And I'm like, well, I've got um, Yahtzee Doctor Who and I've got Outsmarted, which is a, a trivia game where we can play together as teams. But you all have to download an app. But don't worry about it. And, and, and they're like, oh, you, you don't have anything like, you know, tapestry. And you're like, oh, OK, <laughs> then. <laughs> Well, actually, I have my copy of Ark Nova in the trunk, and if you'd like to play it, I can go grab that. So, yeah, always add that this is the thing I'm guilty of. I bring way too many games everywhere, but I tend to do that to events where people expect me to bring too many games. But, like, when I went up to my uncle's then uh, during the – this isn't a holiday, but when I went up to visit my uncle and aunt at their um, their farmhouse – I brought a bag full of games. There was probably six, seven games in there. And we ended up playing two. But when I went, hey, do you guys want to play a game? I didn't go, hey, do you want to play Distilled? Or do you want to play this? Or do you want to play this? I was like, hey, I've got this card game. You guys like card games a lot. I think you'll enjoy this one. And the Deadlies was a fantastic hit at that particular event. And so was Telestrations. Absolutely. All right. So we will be checking in with our chat room once we get through some of our particular family game night favorites. 
Um, so if you do have any more tips, please keep them coming. But what we are going to do now is get back to Ross's actual question. And Ross had asked, what games do you, us, since we're the ones answering the question, what games do you play with parents and family looking for holiday tips? So we're going to list off some games that we personally love playing with our families, which is going to be quite different from our usual game recommendation lists, I, I, I've got to say. So I think what we're going to do is start off with our top five. And then I'll be sharing a bunch more. I've, I've obviously done more gaming with my family than Sean has um, just over the years. So we're going to start off with the top five and then maybe we'll share some other ones that have worked well for us. So for me, it's playing with my kids who are, in fact, gamers. So my list may not be great for the average family gathering because I'm going to start with DC deck building game. Uh, and this one is fantastic. I love it because there are so many different games all contained in one box and it's just mm -hmm. a matter of deciding whether you want to play cooperative or competitive and whether you want to be villains or, or heroes, really. You know, you got a couple of quick choices, but it's all right there in one box. Easy to set up, uh, especially with the uh, the neoprene mat we've got now. So you don't even have to worry about remembering set up at all. You just roll out the mat and slap the cards down in the right spot. So now I know I've asked you this before when you've recommended this game, but it might have changed over the last little while. If someone was new to this game, where's the best place to start now? Uh, if you're starting with, uh, you know, more than two players, uh, I still think it's Teen Titans. I think Teen Titans is is uh, is definitely the one to go to. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, my immediate family are all gamers, right? And I talk about gaming with them all the time. So I'm not going to share the games I like playing with Deanna and my two daughters, because that's what we talk about every week here on the show, pretty much. Um, they're as involved in the hobby as we are. But when I'm looking at my extended family, there's a mix there. Like Deanna's mom is a gamer. She plays a lot of hobby games. She's still kind of blown away by hobby games and how different they are. But again, when I go up north to my Uncle Claude and Nancy's, they are, they are card players. That I wouldn't call them gamers. They play cards. They play lots of different card games. And that's about it. Then we extend things to the even more extended family when I get in my other co my cousins and my aunts and uncles. And yeah, they know what games are. Like I said, my, my two cousins used to play Talisman with us, but like they don't know anything about family or hobby board gaming. When we get a bunch of us together, I break the rules a bit here and I like to break out a game called The Great Del Moody which actually has a lot in common with a game um, that we talked about a lot late with 12 Days of Christmas, because the Great Del Moody is a special deck of cards where there's one, one, two, twos, three, threes, all the way up to 13, 13s. And you play a game. It's a it's a hand shedding game where you're trying to get rid of your cards. Now, the box says something like eight players, but I think I played it with like 18. Um, what happens in that game is the the more players you have, the more merchants you have. And I've actually had uh, my cousin John has a copy. We've combined two copies and then just warned everyone there's two ones and, you know, 12 sixes. This is just everyone gets this game. It's really simple. You someone leads a number of cards. The next player has to play the same number of cards, but a lower number. And you do that until someone's out and then the peon collects the cards. And then the first one out becomes the great Del Moody. The last one out becomes the peon. And then we always play with silly rules. I provide hats. When I bring this out to a family game night, I provide a big ass cowboy hat for the great Del Moody. Um, and then I also have like a gold necklace for them. And we've done various other things for the peon over the years. For years, it was this plastic werewolf mask. But eventually that werewolf mask broke. But that's what the peon had to wear. And the peon doesn't get a chair. And the great Del Moody gets to choose where they sit. It, it mixes a rather solid, tactical, somewhat strategic card game that most card game players are going to understand the concepts of, which is pure silliness. So for me, again, more deck building, but it's a fun kind of competitive deck building, which is clank. Uh, and I find it's, it's the, the level of competition and, but fun, you know, everyone's working on their own and yes, whoever gets out first may or may not win. Uh, but it's far from a guaranteed thing. You can really push your luck and stay down there a little bit longer and come out with the bigger treasures uh, even if you aren't last, as long as you get above ground and, and, you know, it's just that great fun game and everyone's eager and worried about, you know, making too much noise and, and it's just a fun game for, uh, is it max four on that one? I forgot to check. I think it's max. Yeah, I think it yeah. is. Yep. What I like about that one is even when you're out, you want to know how the other players are doing. 
Like it keeps you engaged. You're like, oh, are they going to make it? Are they going to make it? Are they going to get out? Are they going to get out? And that's what makes that game work. So even if you're the first one out, you care a lot about what's still happening in that game. Now, one of the most recent games I personally played with my family, and I already called it out earlier, is with my aunt and uncle um, and and their extended family because my my aunt's sister was over and and their son and daughter were over and all this. We got everyone together and we were playing Telestrations. Telestrations is one of the, the biggest hits that I've had with family events for years. I, I've yet to have it fail. You often do get the player who's like, oh, I don't know how to draw. And you're like, eh, it doesn't matter. And maybe they say no. But this is one I've definitely, we started with an eight player game because some of the family said no. And by the end of the night, we were playing a 12 player game because the people that said no were like, oh, yeah, I want to get in on this. Um, it's a fantastic game. Um, the 12 player party pack's perfect for this. But honestly, there, there's, you could make it longer. <laughs> like if you had multiple sets, you could fit more players. Um, you just got to make sure you have enough pages in the books. Or you just play it so the book doesn't go all the way around, which is another way you can play it with extra players is, yeah, maybe your book only makes it two thirds of the way around the table before you have to reveal. But who cares? The whole fun of Telestrations is the 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 eat poop you cat, the, the telephone game part where the clue you started with is 99 percent of the time, not what you end up with and laughing at things like four legged ducks. Absolutely. Now, sometimes not all family gatherings are big events. Uh, if it's just my son and I, the Duke is a fantastic way to get a little competition on. And it's easily played on any old table you can get your hands on. It just doesn't need a lot of space. It's just a bag and a small board uh, and you're good to go. And uh, while it is competitive, as long as you know that, you know, the people you're playing with are are good for competitive and uh, and not table flippers, it's all fun. This is a good one to bring for uh, that relative that's really into chess. If you, you want to like, hey, I, I know you like chess. You want to try a chess variant? I've had the Duke go over well for that. Now, the other big hit is one I just discovered this year, thanks to Smirk and Dagger um, for forcing us to take home a copy of the Deadlies at Origins. I called this one out when we were talking about what our, our tips but this is Uno for gamers. I, that, that's honestly a really good way to describe it. It is a hand shedding game, but it has no player elimination. It has no scoring. There's no adding up your cards at the end of the round. And there's no real pile on the plus fours, whether you're playing the rules or not. There is some take that to it. And yes, it has a theme that might be a little, little um, depending on how, how religious some of your relatives are, or how young the kids are. The theme is the seven deadly sins, so that could be an issue. So that's a know your audience thing. But it's not salacious. It's not, it, it's silly. It's it's cute animals that represent the different sins. I, I, the Deadlies really is good. I, I can't say enough good things about it. Just check out our review to learn more. Absolutely. And well, for me, well, it's a classic, but it's a classic for a reason. And that's Skip Bow. That's one we love at our house. The whole family and frankly, anyone dropping by can quickly pick it up as it plays up to six. So if your family of four is all playing and you've got uh, people dropping in over the, it's really easy to deal someone in and have them up and playing instantly. Uh, I don't even know if I have rules for the game anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's just one of those card games that, that people just know or don't. And uh, if you know it, you can teach it and get someone playing uh, as quickly as anything else. Uh, my next one that I've had great success with my family is Bean uh, Bonanza, the original Uwe Rosenberg game before he got into heavy euros and polyominoes, uh, the bean planting card game. This is the game I break out for my traditional card gaming family friends and friends where I'm like, all right, you, you, you play normal card games. You'll get this. Now, I will admit it can be a step above what some people are comfortable with it. It does divert from traditional card games in a number of ways. Um, one of the big ones is you can't sort your hand. So the biggest thing that traditional card game players have to learn is don't sort your hand, but there's it's, this is actually a trading and negotiation game. And the big thing I like about Bonanza is it gets people talking. This gets people interacting. This is a game I like to start off a family game night with because you've got that whole you haven't seen each other in six, 12 months and everyone's kind of quiet and trying to do the instead of trying to do the small talk and like, oh, how's school going? 
play a game of Bonanza, and by the end of that, everyone will be talking to each other. And now what's become a family tradition with my sister and her in-laws, uh, by way of me, is Spellmaker. But this is a classic 1978 game that you are not going to find on the major store shelves. Used market, you might be able to find one or two here and there. But uh, this this one, uh, you know, if you if your family has a copy on their shelves, try and break it out for some people on uh, on Christmas sometime. And but do check Board Game Geek. There is a original. Uh, the designer has a, a different plan that it was actually <laughs> released with uh, that I learned about. And uh, making that change to the deck can make a huge difference in how long and painful the game could be. <laughs> Oh, so many long and painful traditional or older games. I don't know what people used to do that they had the entire afternoon to play some of these classics. All right, one for mine. Um, though I got to admit, the last couple of years, we we haven't done this, but a Christmas Eve tradition that started up with um, Deanna's family that we tend to go over on Christmas Eve is to play my copy of Ticket to Ride 10th Anniversary Edition. Now, anyone who's a longtime fan of the show knows I don't love Ticket to Ride. It is not one of my top games in any way, shape, or form, but it's an enjoyable game. And one of the reasons that we started playing it at this was it was easy enough that my kids could play it at a younger age. And it was comfortable for, at the time, my mother-in-law, who was just getting into hobby gaming when we first broke this out the first time. And it just, it's, it's, everyone knows how to play. We all just sit down. Yeah, there's always a couple questions at the beginning, but once people see the root cards, their memory comes back. And I got to say, the 10th anniversary edition is just beautiful, like with the little plastic trains that are all unique per character and the metal tins to put them in. It just it becomes something special. And I don't love Ticket to Ride, but I love playing it on Christmas Eve with that family. And it plays five players, which is another nice one. We have five of us that generally play games together. So, yeah, despite the fact that I probably won't toss it on any other game recommendation list, this is one that we I will happily play every Christmas Eve. Well, there we have it. So those are our top five. Um, now, others, I'm just going to throw out some a bunch of these we've already mentioned, basically, as we we're going through things. I kind of wanted to just scatter this episode with suggestions instead of just giving you a list of 27 of the best games for playing with family. Every family is different, so it's going to be different what works for you and what works for us. Um, Code Names is one, though the teach on that can be rough for people who haven't played it before. Your best bet with Code Names is to have two players who have played before be the team leaders, um, especially if, if you have four people who played before. That way you can have the two team leaders and someone on each team that knows what's going on. It tends to work best if you can show it, because I had this completely flop when I tried to describe it to my family once. Uh, concept we mentioned, point salad we mentioned, Racco. Racco is a classic. Uh, my family loves Racco. Racco is one of the few games I can still get my mom to play. My mom will happily sit down and play Racco with us. Um, there's even like big box editions you can get for more players. One of the huge ones for my gaming family that I find works well, that is pretty accessible to most people, is Space Base, especially with the big box, because then you can play, what is it, seven players, I think, with yeah. the big box. Might even be nine. So that's a good one for big groups. Um, and I haven't tried it with my family yet because I just got it. Um, but I have a feeling Monstrosity would be as big a hit as Telestrations. Well, maybe not as much. It's close. Close to as big a hit as Telestrations. Oh, really? All of these aside, the biggest thing I find I can bring to a family game night that it will probably get played is a deck of cards. My family grew up playing Euchre, Hearts, Spades, all of those games, and that's what they like playing. I know a number of high player count games like Pass, Pass the Ace, um, another one whose name I can't say because we're not explicit, uh, 31 for playing big player count games. I've been to family parties where they had a Euchre tournament um, with my family that also involved having money <laughs> where you had to buy in before playing each round. And if you didn't want to sit out around, you just didn't get the points, you know? So I, on a, we, even though, yes, I'm a hobby gamer. I love hobby games. Um, a tradition, a deck of cards can often come to the rescue. Even if I bring traditional, like a bunch of hobby games, having a peck of cards on hand 
for where you're like, oh, do you want to play this game? It's about this one. Yeah. Oh, we're going to do this trying. Yeah. All right. How about we just play some Euchre? Yeah, sure. Let's go. So along with that kind of traditional game, there's other things out there. And now maybe you want to keep Monopoly, even for those who love it, till at least Boxing Day. Though <laughs> I'm willing to bet that there are some families out there who have that game as a Christmas Day tradition, too. I'm sure. What games is are is are do you love to play with your family over the holidays? Also, if you've got any tips for playing with a mix of gamers and non-gamers, we'd love to hear about them. Uh, either in the comments to this uh, video, or our, can you leave comments on a podcast episode? Maybe on the right podcast player. Uh, you know what? You can DM us. You can contact us on social media. It can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Or better yet, join our Discord, discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Well, I hope that helps some of you get some gaming in this holiday season. That's it for our tips and top games for a successful holiday game night with family. Now it's time to check in with the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. Hey, lobbyists. All right, so recommendations that we didn't already call out in the episode is Project L. Project L is a great game to play with family. I've seen a lot of praise for that game. I have not played it myself, but the name makes me remember number nine. Number nine would be a good one. Number nine's one where you can play an infinite number of players if you have enough copies. I don't know how cheap number nine is, but I know I played a three box game at a board game night where the entire store played the same game at once. And you basically played it like bingo, right? Someone called out seven and everyone put their sevens out. That'd be a good one for, for a big group if you had it. There you go. Uh, we've got not yet played in the chat room saying Super Mega Lucky Box is great for the advanced bingo crowd. Oh, there you go. I, again, I've heard good things about that one. Uh, Red Meeple Ryan called out Zularetto. Um, that is a good one. I we uh, One of the first hobby board games I taught Sean was Zularetto. We brought it up to his house. It was it was still new hotness at the time. <laughs> and we played around to Zularetto. Nice, simple. That's a good one. You can get the kids involved. It, it, you're sorting animals, right? You're drafting and sorting animals by type. And then there's the neat mechanic where if you get a male and a female, you get a bonus animal. Simple to learn. Just don't bother teaching people the scoring. Just to kind of give them an idea what they're going for and work out the score at the end on your own. I was tempted at one point to start suggesting some sports games. But at the same time, there's so many sports on TVs. It's going to be hard to compete with that sort of thing. And a lot of them yeah. have that little heavier weight or at least entry point of knowledge that's required. Even if you understand baseball perfectly, Playing the baseball board game is going to take a little bit of extra of ramp up and stuff. So unless you've got some sort of, you know, dexterity based uh, football game or something that you can play, uh, some of those sport games may not be the best, despite the holidays being quite a sporting type of time often. Yeah, again, your dexterity games are probably your, your go to's here, right? You can still buy the old electric football, the mm -hmm. vibrating table that still yep. exists. Um, like the company that made them back then still makes them now. I can't remember the name of the company off the top of my head. Some of the, um, the tabletop curling type games yeah, and things uh, like the that. Tabletop curling. Um, uh, what's it called? The, the one that originated in Ontario hexagonal board played it at origins. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> Crokinole. Wow. Yes. Crokinole. Crokinole. Wow. Sorry. Crokinole is a great one. Yeah. You, you set up the table, you play, you play, you know, uh, a, a two player, four player game and then switch up who's playing. Crokinole was a great one, actually. I, that, that, you, do I, need the, you do need a good flat table for that one. So, yeah, that's true. You, you need your folding table in the backs. Um, Twilight Imperium during the holidays. We did. <laughs> we used to do a, a, a Twilight Imperium night this time of year because people tended to be off work and have time off. So we would do a, a big Twilight Imperium and order pizza thing. That was third edition, though. I didn't actually pick up fifth. Uh, what else do we have? Do we have much else on here? No. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, Point Salad is, is really a great one, though. I definitely recommend, yep. like, if you're going to throw something into your pockets for uh, for for a, a holiday with family, Point Salad is just fantastic. It's so easy to mm. pick up. Like, there's no, you don't even need rules for that game. <laughs> yeah, almost not. Uh, Blood on the Clock Tower is a, a recommendation from Eggman based on Werewolf because it's one of those the players still play until the end. Um, even has one more vote after you're dead. You still get a vote. Um, there's lots of others. There's all the one night werewolf. There's, there's enough variants now that make it. So for one, there's no player in elimination. Two, there's no um, moderator required. 
uh, just as usual that those aren't games we're generally huge fans of. So, and I think actually for sale, uh, mentioned in the chat room is yep. a great suggestion, especially yep. if you've got people who are eager to play Monopoly, but you all know it's a bad idea. <laughs> get something like for yep. sale out there where you get a bit of that, uh, you know, that real estate trading going on, but you don't have table flipping moments and you don't have fights yes. over, uh, you know, free parking and, and all the, and all the things that come with, uh, as baggage along with Monopoly. Hey, if you're going to play Monopoly, at least sit down and agree on your house rules before you start. <laughs> Actually, yes. that goes for any of these games. Whenever you're getting together with family. Uh, if you're going to play play Uno, make sure, you know, which rules are you using. Can you play a plus four, draw four on top of a draw four or not? Um, if you're playing Monopoly, are you putting the money on free parking? Like, like talk about all that before you start. Yeah, That's important. Even with worse. Catan. Nothing worse than, than, than fighting with the family over holidays over something as silly as a board game. Yes. Yes. Catan's another one. A lot of people have house rules for Catan. And most don't make the game worse. And most of the people I know that hate Catan hate it because they were playing with people who change the rules in some way and thinking they're making it better. Uh, be so fair, Project L is Tetris based. I now remember it. There is a Tetris game. Drop It would be a great one because mm -hmm. you can do teams. We've done teams in Drop It. I played Drop It with eight players before and it worked. Yep. Um, we should call it No Thanks. I'm, I'm kind of surprised we didn't think of it. No, what it is, I don't own No Thanks. Mm. Despite the number of times I recommend people buy that game and the number of times I played it at events, it's never been my copy. <laughs> no Thanks is another good big group one. Nice, simple to teach. Do you want the card or not? Put a token on or keep it. Add them up. Only the lowest card in a straight counts. Yeah, not yet played is mentioning roll and rights. Yeah, again, you know, especially yeah. if you've got that single input, multiple output type game where only one person is just rolling the dice every time. You don't have to pass dice around. Everyone mm -hmm. just kind of does their own thing based on whatever the dice say. That's a that's a great way to to yeah. make things easy. Like all you have to do is here, take this card and do something based on these numbers or, or whatever. Um, that's and then a great the, way to get people involved. And there's really simple ones too, like you like quicks. Right. Like you don't have to grab Thrones of Valeria or uh, Dice <laughs> Kingdoms of Valeria may not be the best one to hand out to your family when they have to decide, well, which way do I go on this path and where do I spend this? No, stick to the simpler ones in yeah. general. Unless, unless you have a family that's like super into games or like, oh, we love dice games. We love Yahtzee. We love zombie dice. Show us something more. Then maybe you bring it out again. This is all going to be very tailored to whoever you're playing with. Absolutely. No, thanks. Play seven. See, I actually thought it was more. I think I played more. I don't think there's. Again, like, I, I don't know what the actual player limit is on the Great Del Moody. I, we just, everyone's hands are smaller if you play with more people and players get eliminated a little quicker, but it still works. All right. Thank you very much, Lobby, for those additional suggestions. Um, I, I greatly appreciate uh, everyone who showed up tonight. We've had a very busy chat room, which is awesome. A nice uh, way to close out the year for us. Um, so again, we're going to be back once more, but by the time that episode goes live, it'll be 2024. Wow. So thank you all for joining us for that chat. Please stick around, though. We're going to refill our coffees. Then we get a review. And then I've got quite a bit to talk about in the Bellhops tabletop. Uh, you'll get to learn lots about the 12 game uh, Bah Humbug and the 12 games of Christmas. Welcome to a look at a very seasonally appropriate game. The Kringle Caper from Grand Gamers Guild, who we have to thank for our review copy. So the Kringle Caper was the first game ever released in the Holiday Hijink series of escape room games from Jonathan Schaefer and Grand Gamers Guild, who first published this game back in 2020. This small escape room in a box style game is designed for one or more elves of any age with a playtime of about an hour. It has a listed difficulty of two out of three. As expected, this game features a North American Christmas theme that has you playing elves at the North Pole trying to solve the case of a missing cookie. This is all done through a set of 18 double-sided cards and a web app. As this is an escape room game and we didn't want to spoil anything, we don't have an unboxing to share with you tonight. Plus, there isn't much to see here. Like all <laughs> holiday hijinks games, the Kringle Caper is just a small card pack with 18 cards. In the pack, you get the instructions, which provide a QR code to a web app. Now, the quality here is good, but nothing fancy. In addition to the stuff you get in the pack, you are probably going to want some scrap paper and something to write with. Now, I also strongly suggest a set of card sleeves and some wet erase markers. Or I guess you can use Sharpies if you don't want to reuse your card sleeves. 
because some of these puzzles are going to be much easier to solve if you write on the cards. And by putting them on sleeves, it makes it so you can still have a playable game at the end instead of making it a one and done, which for one is more environmentally sound, but also it lets you gift the game to someone else once you've completed it. As for how to play, it's really simple. You unpack the cards and place the deck face down without looking at any of them. You load up the web page and pick the appropriate game. As this is the first of the Holiday Hijinks games, it's right at the top of the page. That will start a timer and instruct you to grab card one. It then presents the start of the story. Now on the cards, you're going to find some form of puzzle to solve and one or more magnifying glass symbols. For every magnifying glass symbol, you will have to enter an answer on the web app. If you get it right, the app will continue the story and have you draw another card. Now, some puzzles will require more than one card, and most of these will require familiarity with North American Christmas traditions, the Santa-based ones and not religious ones. If you aren't familiar with these or just can't remember what was given on the ninth day of Christmas, the app includes a list of traditional holiday songs, writings, and poems to help you out. There's also a progressive hint system if you get stuck. You continue solving puzzles, entering answers, and reading the story till you eventually find out who the culprit is. At that point, you're given a final score and have the option to submit that score to Grand Gamers Guild, where they'll use it to help set the difficulty level and things like that on future holiday hijinks games. They just record information like how long it took you, how many clues you used, and so on. Now, despite the fact this is the first holiday hijinks game, this isn't the first you've played with your family. No, that's right. This is actually the fifth holiday hijinks game I played um, just due to the fact that Mark from Grand Gamers Guild handed me a stack of them at once. So we've just been playing each of them as we get close to each of the holidays that have been featured. Now, if you have time, I invite you to check out our ho other holiday hijinks reviews. These include the independence incident, the pumpkin problem, the turkey trial and the birthday burglary. So how did this one compare to the others? I know you've been impressed by the variety in previous games. So I think it seemed obvious to me or it stuck out to me that this was the first game in the series as it is extremely linear. You start at card one. It has a puzzle on it. You solve it. It says draw card two, which has a different puzzle on it. You solve that and then you draw card three. Yes, eventually some puzzles have you draw two cards when you finish and some of the solutions may need you to use cards you used earlier. You might have to go back. Uh, but basically you are handheld through this entire thing It is purely linear. Now, while that may be a bit of a letdown for people who've played many of these before, it does, however, sound like a great introduction, mm -hmm. as well as a great one to introduce family who aren't gamers at the holidays to. Yeah, and I agree. And unlike some of the later games in the series, like there's no branching paths. There's no feeling of exploration. It doesn't feel like a point and click adventure. It feels like a series of puzzles that when you solve them unlocks the next part. You're never presented with more than one puzzle at once either. Now, that is a mixed blessing. Now, on one hand, it makes this the most accessible holiday hijinks game for families, especially those with young kids, because this is so simple and straightforward. On the other hand, though, with only presenting one puzzle at a time, it did make it kind of hard to collaborate with others while playing the Kringle Caper. Most of the puzzles here actually could only really be played by one person, like worked on by one person at a time. Because they involved uh, like physical puzzles, right? They involved searching for words or comparing two images to look for differences or solving a map, for example, or a maze. Now, if you do have more than just a couple of players, what you're probably going to want to do to kind of spread out the fun is have take turns flipping over the cards, right? Because like I said, it's, it's linear. So I solve puzzle two. You get to try puzzle three first. You read the puzzle three card. You try to solve it. And then you only get the other players involved if you get stuck and need help. So it could be nice if you have a group during the holidays to let everyone have a try at a puzzle and work together on anything that gives you a hard time. Yeah, pretty much. Now, as for the difficulty uh, in the Kringle Caper, it seemed good. Uh, there were some puzzles we solved instantly, like like we got like the first letter and like, oh, it's obviously this. Um, th those you just fly through, right? You progress the story quickly. Other puzzles took some thinking. And I will say there is one puzzle that had us stumped and did make us glad that there were four of us at the table so that we could bounce ideas off each other and eventually got unstuck. Uh, we did not use any clues, but we did answer uh, a couple of the questions wrong, which I think affected our score. Uh, they rated this a two out of three based on the other games, and I can say that seems about right. 
No, this is for a family that grew up with North American Christmas traditions, who know all the songs, mostly by heart, and know what Santa's list is all about. Yeah. The difficulty is going to be significantly higher for a family who is new tr to these traditions. Yeah, because all of all the holiday hijinks games we played, um, this is the one that made me want to write on the cards the most. Um, this one really, like I said, the style of puzzles were very, you know, go to the corner store and buy a book of games to, to you know, do on the train is kind of the feeling it gave me. Even with sleeves, though, you're going to have at least one puzzle in here that's not going to work for sleeves. and You're still going to want to write on the cards. Now, what I ended up doing is I just used my phone and I took a picture of it. And then went to the went to my, you know, graphics thing and used markup so I could draw on it digitally. Um, so that is something to be aware of that, that there is definitely they expect you to draw on the cards in this particular game. And that's actually a great solution as there are so many apps that you can doodle with and manipulate things on your phone. Why not use it? We, even though you've got a physical object right there in front of you, yep. saves on wear and tear and helps make that game easy to pass on to someone else to enjoy rather than uh, heading off to the landfill early on. And fair enough, I probably could have done that for every card in the game instead of using the sleeves. But there is something tactile, and I just, I'm, I'm old school. I prefer actually drawing. But there was one, like I said, there was no way to get that into a sleeve and try to solve. Uh, overall, we had a good time playing through the Kringle Caper. It was four of us. It was uh, me, Deanna, and both of my kids. I know my kids are, are teens now. They're older. It's a, they're not little kids. The story was cute. Uh, the puzzles were well-designed. And and just hard enough. I, the, the nice part, though, is that, like the theme worked like it, you got that Santa. I, I could have been in a Christmas special, right? Rankin Bass could have uh, animated our adventures. And it gave that North American Christmas feel. Uh, lots of references to longstanding holiday traditions. So as long as you're up to speed with the standard North American Christian traditions of a secular style, you should be able to enjoy this. Then again, if you want to learn more about these traditions, this might be a fun way, especially because all the info is there on the web app to re uh, reference. I think Sean said North American Christian traditions, Christmas traditions, which I do know I have some roots with Christian traditions. This actually, I was thinking about it, the, the way you worded that is it, it might also be a great way to teach someone about North American Christmas traditions or to, to familiarize yourself with them if you are not familiar with them. I got to say, if you're looking for a fun holiday activity to do with your family, uh, especially if you have kids who will get a kick out of being elves running around the North Pole solving a mystery, you should pick this game up. Uh, you can get it in print, or there's a print and play version. You can get it direct from Grand Gamers Guild, where you can also use our code BELLHOP to save 10% on any other games, including this one. While there, be sure to check out the other holiday hijink games. Each is themed after a different holiday, with the next one coming up being Groundhog Day. And I'm sure we'll be back in probably late January with a review of that one as well. Well, that's it for our look at the Kringle Caper, the first game in the holiday hijink series of escape room games from Grand Gamers Guild. If you enjoyed this review, how about you treat us to a coffee over at coffee.com, ko-fi.com, slash tabletop bellhop or i guess maybe at this point a cup of hot cocoa is probably more fitting and now in the bellhops tabletop we look back at the games we played since last episode uh so one of the things that happened this past weekend is we did head over to brenda's house for some family gaming uh not holiday gaming but family gaming so it's it's in the holiday so it goes with our main topic tonight i guess um, and Deanna, Brenda, and Genevieve continued their playthrough of The Ghost in the Machine from the Mysterious Package Company, which, you know, we held off on doing a review on this because it was out of print for so long. And we're like, oh, it's back in print. Let's go. Let's do it. It's out of print again. So uh, we're going to keep talking this one up and keep talking about it at this point. When, when we're done playing, we will just put out the review. But I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to do it around print runs. But I got to say this one, obviously, is proving to be extremely popular. At least it, they're selling copies. I, I have to assume people are enjoying it and telling other people to play it. Um, this one, uh, I, I don't remember how much I talked about the story, so I'm not going to really get into the story here. But um, they continue to make progress. Um, we are well aware that the game is broken into two parts. In my head, based on our previous experience with escape room games, that meant two sessions to me. They, they, there are two which way style books involved in this investigation. And it's very different from the other ones we played because this is a first person perspective where you are playing the detective 
and you are reading through a which way book that talks like in first person, like I went here and I talked to this and I saw this. And then it's like, who do you want to talk to? Where do you want to go? And it's combined with the kind of coded chronicles style system that we reviewed in the past where like there'll be the, 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 the directory of the city and every house has a house number like in real life. And well, that's the passage you would go to the book and that's how you, you play this game. Um, so these are thick books. And we're like, okay, we're playing, they're playing, they're playing. And, and like, it felt like we got a good chunk done the first time. Then they played for a little over an hour again this time. And like, we're looking at, I don't know, two to three hours total. And they're still like in the middle of the first book. Like they've unlocked a part where they have an entire map of London and haven't touched it at all. They've just explored this one warehouse and followed like the, the trails from there. And there's still like the wander around London and, and like, I, I'm like, man, like, when are we going to finish this? Right. Cause I wanted to get the review up there for the holidays originally. And I'm like, how many times are we going to have to play this? So I decided to look into it and I go on mysterious package company site. And I'm like, I'm, this information's there. It's white, right in my face. I'm not surprised. Like it, it's not hidden anywhere. I just based it on my previous example. Uh, I did a bad thing, right? I made an assumption. I made an ass out of you and me. I, I looked, I, I just assumed it's probably, there's two books. It'll be two sessions. No, the playing time on this is like minimum eight hours. These are big games. Like, like there's a lot of story here. I had no clue that Mysterious Package Company compared to, you know, an exit game are in like two different worlds. Yeah, it's, it's uh, the, uh, the full mystery novels. <laughs> <laughs> basic yeah. books as as their clue books uh you know which way style books as they are uh while impressive uh makes it kind of i guess maybe not as surprising that these are a hunk of game compared to yeah. uh you know an escape room box that or the the uh you know some of the exit series boxes where you couldn't fit that book in it <laughs> yes <laughs> no i agree i totally agree what what i am finding with this and i don't know if deanna agrees because she's enjoying playing it with a with her mom and her daughter is to me, it feels more like a, a single player experience. Like uh, you sit down and play an hour before bed kind of thing because of this, because it's it's more of a, a interactive novel with a murder mystery and, and some physical clues than it is really like a an investigation game. So I've noted this before. They're not really my type of game. And Last session, I, I kind of played. I sat off to the side and I interjected now and then like, hey, remember this or don't forget that person or oh, what about whatever clue this time, though, I wanted to take some time to further dive into Bah Humbug and the 12 Days of Christmas because I knew there were solo games in there. So my plan was I'm going to bring a copy of that along. They're going to play the murder mystery and I'm going to steal a corner of the table to uh, sit down and play a couple of these solo games. So I started off, I, I didn't prep a lot ahead of time, but I did want to read the rules ahead of time. So before we're even at the the event and before we're at Brenda's, I grab the PDF and I look through the, there's like a table of contents that lists the games. And I see the Duke's Daughters. It's listed as one to four players. And I'm like, oh, perfect. I'll learn the Duke's Daughters. So I jump to the Duke's Daughters and I see that it says player count three to six. And I'm like, what? What the heck? So then I sort through like there's cards, right, that we had. Well, the card says one to four players. So I'm like, OK, I'm just going to have to read how to play this game and figure out, is this one to four or is this three to six? So I start reading and they always have like the setup is first. And then on the next page, there's like a setup diagram. So I read through the setup and I'm like, OK, yeah, I, like it, yeah, there's hands of cards, but I guess I can play single handed. And then I get to the actual example setup and it's two player. And I'm like, well, what the heck? Like, here it is saying it's three to six player, and here it is showing me the two player setup. I, I like, I again, have we mentioned this is a prototype? Yeah, sadly, the rule book seems very much a work in progress. Though, I, I have to say, the idea of trying to project manage a rule book for a game with 13 different designers seems yeah. like an absolute nightmare to me so i can as a, a project manager commiserate with the people who are organizing this yeah again there's plenty of time this isn't coming out until the holidays next year i hope they get all this sorted out i, I don't want to bemoan it too much but yet again i will say if i we'd realized just how much of a prototype we were taking home we probably wouldn't have asked to bring this home to talk about it 
So what I don't actually know is if this particular game was one to four in my version and then became three to six with a rule revision. Cause we did see that with one of the games Sean tried with us where like, I learned to play the game based on the back of a card and it's very different than what was in the instructions. So I don't know what happened, but I just, I kept reading the Duke's daughters and it definitely seems like more than one player. I don't know if it seemed like three to six, but it didn't seem like a solo game at all. So then I looked for another one. So the next one I found was called ladies dancing. This all seemed to tie together. I like the examples, everything. I'm like, okay. And then this in the rule book specifically had set up for one player. So I'm like, okay, this one really can play one player. So the theme of this one is you are a chaperone for a group of ladies going to a dance. And remember, this is a Victorian themed game. So Victorian period going to a big ball. I'm trying to find a partner. Uh, there are going to be a number of suitors who are waiting to dance with your ladies. Now, this is a rondelle based drafting game where the goal is to get each of your ladies to dance with the same suitor at least three times out of six dances. And if you made if you, if you dance with the same suitor three times, you've made a match. Now, there are some rules they, like you can't dance with the same person twice in a row and there's special rules for drafting, whatever. I'm not going to get into all that. Now, the whole thing is you are trying to find a match for each of your ladies, but there's bonus points. And I thought this was was neatly thematic. If the five golden rings, one of the five golden rings is in your cards, you get bonus points because not only did you make a match, you got a proposal. And then there's also a bonus if the last dance card is with your match. So the last card you draft for that lady, then the dance ends with a kiss, which is worth bonus points. And I got to say, I think that fits that Victorian Christmas ball really well. I, I I thought that was neat and well done. Like whoever whoever did the designing and tying the theme to the mechanics here. Yes, I'm just drafting cards and I'm trying to make sets of three. But I think it works really well, especially those bonus point systems. The fact that we've got Mo talking about theme in a game says something about yes. how well themed it is. True. true. Very true. So the regular listeners of the show know that we don't always talk about a theme as much as we should. Uh, yep. But this this obviously got you hooked. Yeah, I don't know. It just, it just made I, I, the golden ring thing caught me. I'm like, oh, and of course, it's called a proposal. Like I'm reading the rules going, yeah, that makes sense. OK, I get it. Um, as for the gameplay, it's solid. Um, now, there were special rules for one player. Uh, it basically changed the choice. From what you're drafting, instead, it forced you to draft and you decided where it went. So it was kind of a difference. If you were playing multiplayer, it was very much like patchwork. There was a little pawn and you had to pick like, I, I think if you were on a six, you got to pick from the next six cards. Whereas if you're playing solo, your only option is at the beginning of the game, you put it on a card. And then whatever number of that card is that you draft that next, and you keep going around the clock. So you get a choice at the beginning, but it's more about, OK, I'm going to move from the 12 to the eight. Which lady do I want the 12 to go to? Which do I want the eight to go to? Um, this once you once I got past that, it just it felt like playing solitaire, right? Like traditional card game, um, solitaire, right? Um, playing card game, which also seemed to have the difficulty that goes with that, right? Because similar to playing card game solitaire, um, I am pretty sure there was no possible way for me to win that game based on the card dealt. Like it was one of, it was predetermined before I started. Now, to be fair, there's so many permutations. Maybe I just picked the wrong card to start on and that ruined my game. But like, I wouldn't have known what cards were coming either way. So I, it was, it was neat enough. Um, the big thing though, is I, I like the theme and I like the mechanics. I like the drafting. There was neat stuff here. I really want to try ladies dancing with more players. So, yeah, it's it's pretty standard for a lot of solitaire games where you just can't always win if the shuffle plays out against you uh, in many of the different solitaire games. So, yeah. while unfortunate, that's kind of kind of goes with the uh, kind of goes with the uh, territory. Yep. Now, what was interesting here that I want to call out uh, is so. So I went back to go look for the next game. Right. And I go through the 12 games of Christmas. And I'm not seeing another solitaire game. And I'm like, well, except for the one that didn't work. And I'm like, wait, wait, this is Bah Humbug in the 12 games of Christmas. Well, underneath the list of the, like, first is Bah Humbug, right? Uh, I'll get to this this one in a bit. The game is a re-release re of Bah Humbug, and there's 12 bonus games in there. What ends up, there's even more. There are actually two bonus party games, including a social deduction game. 
which I don't know if we'll actually try before we play it, but big high player count games. And there's a bonus solo game called the bonus solo game, which is what I tried next. This is the Merrily on High Street. Now, for this one, you make a hotel. You're going to take the wreath cards and you put them up one through 12. You've got the even number cards on one side and the odd number cards on another. And that's two columns on each side of these are these elevator cards and one elevator is going up. One's going down. So it's at the top and the bottom of the stack. You are playing the manager of the hotel who has to respond to call bells being rung by the occupants. Now, this actually plays similar to Pandemic for anyone who's familiar with that rather popular game with a now more unfortunate theme that it used to have. Um, this is you have a special subset of the normal set of cards that you only use cards, um, so two of each of the cards, one to 12, and you shuffle those and you draw three. And you put bells in the floors that you drew. You're then going to take actions with your, your pawn and move between the floors and remove the bells, right? You, you, you are the, the medic or whatever. You automatically cure every, every bell that's there. Um, there's some neat stuff here with some little additional themes. Like if you stop on a floor with a jingle bell symbol on it, you can call the bellhop, who will take one bell for you from even if you couldn't reach it. There's rules for actually using the elevators to move between floors, but you can only get on them if they're on the same floor as you. Um, it, it, that's all kind of neat. But then when every the elevators are also kind of your timing mechanism, anytime either of the elevators hits the top or bottom, they switch which way they're going. You then reshuffle the discards back on top of the deck. Um, you grab three cards off the deck, shuffle them in and put it on top. Now, this part is really like pandemic, because what that means is the more often this happens, you have the same cards come up. Uh, Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters does the exact same thing, right? It does the exact deal where you're 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 drawing cards to see where bad things happen, but then when a certain bad thing happens, those same cards go on the top of the deck, so they're going to come up more often. Um, you keep playing. Uh, you lose if a floor gets four bells, or if there are over twelve bells out at once. So you you've lost control. You win if you make it through your eight hour shift and you use a little clock and a timer. Um, then there's this weird thing, which I think is just in there because it's solitaire and you want to have something to, to beat, right. A score to beat where you can keep playing. So like, yeah, I made it through my eight hour shift. Now you play for tips and this is just a way you get like a score on a graph and beat your high score. Cause I worked four hours or you can work at most 12 hours and you earn tips for the bells that are left in your, in this, whatever. I ended my game as a porter with two tips, which except for the two tips is pretty much as bad as you can go, but I did still win. Now, this is the first game that you've ever actually played that has a bellhop in the game. Yes. Wasn't there a bellhop in like Cthulhu Death May Die or one of those? So isn't that one of the characters? Oh, um, possibly. I, I swear I played something with a bellhop character. It's funny because they it's actually, close if it's not. they actually tried to upsell us on this game because of yes. the tie-in uh, after we introduced ourselves at the booth uh, at yes. Origins. That was a little disappointing because I thought you play the bellhop. You're really the manager. The bellhop's just like someone you call to go like take care of something. You're I want to play the game where I'm the bellhop. Like, <laughs> come on, I'm in the elevators. Shouldn't it be the bellhop who's responding to the calls, not the manager? It'd be cooler that way. Uh, overall, this one was interesting. Uh, it was fiddly. It very much felt like a single player board game for someone who's played games like Friday and whatever. Uh, solo board games tend to be fiddly and, and you're managing cards and you're moving cards and reshuffling decks. Um, one of the problems is our prototype copy didn't even have enough components to play this as is. Uh, like we only have one arrow and you need three because one's for the clock and one shows which way one elevator is going. One shows which way the other elevator is going. Like I made do, I was able to play it. I just put a coal at the top of the card or the bottom of the card and switched it. That worked because you didn't need coal otherwise. Our game was neat enough, but like I said, this it felt like playing a solo board game with all the fiddliness. And I was just fine when I play those. I'm like, give me an app. <laughs> I, hope I possibly would play this again. I'm no solar gamer. Yeah, we've, we've never made any secret that we're just not big solo gamers. So, uh, you know, I... Take that as it is, and and you you're you're aware that you're not really coming to us for those uh, those big no. solo game reviews. I I probably should have a go to solo pod game uh, solo gaming podcast to send people to, um. But unfortunately, I didn't have that prep. Party of One is one I can pull off the top of my head. Uh, there are others out there. There are are excellent podcasters who cover solo games. 
We're going to have to make a deal with one of them so that we call them out whenever anyone asks us about solo games. Uh, I'm going to stick with the same game, even though, like, chronologically, this wasn't on the same night. But we also did try out Bah Humbug, because as I said earlier, um, this is Bah Humbug and the 12 Games of Christmas. And the main thing this game was, it was kickstarted, was a reprinting of Bah Humbug, which was an existing game. And I didn't take the notes here to figure out when it was published or whatever. Uh, Bah Humbug is a simple bluffing game. And it uh, we played four players. It was Deanna, myself and the kids. And we actually wanted to try this out because I'm like, if I'm going to review Bah Humbug in the 12 Days of Christmas, I better play Bah Humbug in addition to at least a few of the 12 games of Christmas. Indeed. Despite the additional games not being finished, we would kind of expect the prime content, which is the reprint of an existing game, to be nothing but polish and shine uh, on, uh, on an otherwise unfinished product. Yeah. Now, what I don't know is I've never played the original, so I don't know if this deviates, how this deviates from the original at all. I I couldn't tell you. Um, looking at pictures, they look similar. It ends up the card design is actually from the original game. The 13 card deck is the same. Or sorry, 12. 12 suit deck Not is the Moody. same. <laughs> yes, I know. Like Everyone keeps talking about how unique this deck is, and I'm like, but it's Del Moody. Um, so you start this game up by setting up, we called them the wreath cards, but I guess they're now called evergreen cards. But anyway, you put a ring that says one to 12 and all that is, is a placement. You put the post box in the middle, scatter the coal and berries inside the ring. And that's mainly just cause it looks pretty. Um, players get a hand of eight cards. Last player to mail a letter starts. They're going to sit there and they're going to go 12 drummers drumming and put eight card on the 12 spot. Then the next player is going to call out and go 11 pipers piping and play uh this uh, card in the 11 spot and then this continues and you keep going down the various days of christmas until someone goes bah humbug because they think you're full of bs and the card you put down doesn't actually match that number so they tap the mailbox and the reason for the tap the mailbox is your whole slap game in case two people call bah humbug at once the person whose hands on the bottom of the pile on the thing get to do it which i gotta say props for realizing this is the thing so having a mechanic to determine if two people yell bah humbug at once, who goes? So I got to give them props for that. You then flip that card over. It says bah humbug, though I don't really, except for the fact that it says bah humbug, there's not a real great reason to do so. We found after our second round, we didn't bother. Uh, but then you start flipping over the cards played, starting with um, the card that bah humbug was called on. If the person played the proper card, the person, they get, they get a berry. Um, they technically steal it from the person who called Bah Humbug if they have any berries. If it's the other way around and they lied, the person who called Bah Humbug gets a berry. Then you start revealing the cards going backwards down the clock, and every card that doesn't match the card played was a successful lie by that player, and they get to collect coal because they're nasty bad people, so they collect coal. Then there's a special rule where if the postman's played, you don't reveal the rest, but that's not important. Clear all the cards, everyone draws up the eight cards, start a new round, but now you start at 11. And then the next round, you start at 10, then you start at 9, which of course means it's going to become more and more common that players don't have the cards that match. And those high number cards, like there's more 12s than anything else. Well, after round one, those 12s are useless. They're only useful for BSing people. Uh, you keep playing that way. First player to collect three berries or five coal wins. So you could win either way. There's a bit more to it, but I think that covers the gist of it. So pretty much straightforward, bluffing, push your luck game. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, nice and, and, and well themed. Again, we, we've talked about the art on these cards and we do love the Victorian art on these cards. But yep. as the game goes, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, it was solid enough. Uh, it, it, what I liked is it was more of a bluffing game than a social deduction game. It sold to us like, oh, about humbug, a social deduction game. I don't know. There's the like. Yes, there's that bit of reading the other players. Um, I got to say, if they stumble on what their number is, because the cards say what they are. So if you're like, oh, it's five um, uh, 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 drummers drumming. It, oh, it's five golden rings, whatever. <laughs> so if you do that, people are like, oh, oh they mustn't. <laughs> they, yeah, bah humbug. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it was dead simple to teach. And like, like you just, I just gave you a full basic teach on how to play, except for the special rules for the postman. Um, it just, I don't know. There, there wasn't a lot of meat there, but to be fair, sometimes that's a good thing. Both my kids loved this game. They immediately not only wanted to play another round, but they both asked, and this was weird. I expected this from the younger kid. Can I bring this to school? My friends would love this game. Both of them. 
the high schooler and the grade schooler wanted to take my prototype copy of Bah Humbug in the 12 Days of Christmas and bring it to school. And I'm like, but I don't even have an instruction book. It's on my phone. Oh, no, no. I know how to play. I don't Personally, I've found every other game, including the solo games, to be more engaging and more interesting than this. But you know what? I, this shows the broad appeal of the games in this box. In the whole, there's going to be something for everyone. Yeah, well, this is very much a, not an R type of game. I can see the appeal of it, and I do expect that it's the sort of game that would go over well with a bunch of kids at school, where getting away with things is kind of what they're into at that age. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And to tie it into our topic tonight, I think this would be a great one for Family Game Night. I think it said it played six. Uh, was the official player count on this particular one. But again, like as long as everyone can have eight cards, I I don't see why you couldn't play with more players. Though I think what would happen is it wouldn't get all the way around the table. Someone would call Bah Humbug before everyone got to play. Now, of course, the other game I played this past week, we were just talking about, that's the Kringle Caper. Um, I had planned to save that for next week um, when we were less busy, but we managed to squeeze it in. Um, I wanted to make sure this one got out before the big day. So I, I think that's important. So I wanted to get it out before we canceled. So we got the family together last night and I've already talked about it in the review other. It, it was quite fun. Um, the, for me, the, the thing I thought was neat is it, this felt like the first holiday hijinks game. And it's nice to see how it evolved from this. Uh, well, I didn't mind it here. If every holiday hijinks game was as linear as this one, I probably would have soured on the series. I'm glad they didn't just stick to this formula of, like I said, games magazine style puzzles presented in a linear form to unlock parts of a story. It's not all that all the way through. So I, I, I am glad to see that. And I don't mind at all that the first game's like that. Actually, it's a good introduction to the series of games. Yeah, it's interesting to see the roots of the series emerge this way, even if wasn't in the order that they originally happened in. They were released yeah. in, you know, finding finding this now uh, well, isn't a bad thing at all, like, especially since we know that, you know, they get better. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily better, but different. Like yeah. like uh, the variety is the, is the shining part of these games is they don't feel the same. Yeah, and Which we've talked every time about, you know, oh, I wonder what they're going to do next. Well, we wonder what they did the first time, and now we know, and, and, yes. and how it's changed since then. So what and about spoiler? What they are doing next is Easter and wedding. Interesting marriage. I, I can't remember the names, but there is Easter. I think it's the Easter extravaganza and then the wedding something. So the next two games, um, this isn't like hot news that no one's released, but the next two games in the series are going to be Easter and wedding themed. All right. Well, what about plans for the coming weeks? Uh, so I still haven't done the unboxing day. I know I keep saying I have to do it and I do have to do it. I, I don't think you have anything left. Do you? Um, Nothing of note. I may have some like dice yeah, or something. Like, <laughs> I, I was going through the Excel sheet and I'm like, I don't think Sean even has uh, an unboxing. Day. Like there's one we have in our pocket still that will probably go out on Monday or Tuesday next week. But after that, I think we're out. So so even more so than I need to unbox them so we can play the games. We do have plenty of open stuff to play. I need to unbox them so that we don't stop putting out unboxings. So I got to get that done at some point with a week off. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to find time in there. Um, the other thing, I have a bunch of written reviews to catch up on. And I don't I doubt people consume our all three forms of our reviews, the audio, the visual. I assume they do their favorite. Well, if anyone's a fan of the written reviews, I'm sorry we're a little behind. I have I have two to write still, and that's not counting the one from tonight. So really, there's three reviews that have to go out there. So we've kept up on the podcast pretty good, and we kind of kept up on YouTube. I do have to catch up on some of the written reviews. Well, with more people either off or on breaks for the holiday or swamped with holiday cheer, it's hard to say who'll be able to be around to see online content. True. But we do hope folks can catch what they can, maybe catch up with our content, leave it on in the background, like the Yule Log over the holidays. Oh, God, just having a... We did that at one board game event, and I'm like, no, turn us off. <laughs> Don't just leave us on the background. Uh, as for game playing, um, I, I know Sean's in Windsor this weekend. I'm hoping we can kind of get together. We do have plans on Sunday, but maybe Saturday or Friday we'll figure something out um, and get some games played. Um Maybe even I'll get unboxings done before that and we can try some new stuff 
But uh, I, I, we need some more Mar- Marrakesh, and uh, we've got Distilled. I'd like to get in one more game. We're like, we're like, we got a bunch, like a pack of games that were like one or two plays away from being able to root Kapow. That's the other one. We need to just play around with that second box just a bit. Maybe try one four player game. Like, there's all these games that were like, I can almost review it. We we need to hammer those out and then maybe try something new. Now, for anyone local, though, we do have a game night scheduled for the 23rd. That is a week from this Saturday or this Saturday, if you're listening at home. The 23rd of December is uh, the last barbershop bar game night of the year. Um, I still don't know if we'll be able to make it for sure, but that may be another chance. So maybe we'll have lots to talk about when we get back on the 27th. Uh, well, I'm traveling on the 23rd and 24th. So while I could possibly make the start of the barbershop event, it yeah. would only be adding to my driving time. And I'm already crossing my fingers for good weather on this yes. one. So well, I saying they might be able to make it out. So there's a reason for me to try even harder. All right, there we go. Well, before we start locking things down, let's take a moment to thank a selection of our tabletop bellhop Patreon patrons. Their support helps keep this show going. Thank you to the Misdirected Mark podcast. Donna, thank you, Pax. Evil John, thank you, John. Carlos, thanks, Tycho. And Valentine Peach, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors and post up a sign saying we're closed next week. Though the doors are closed and we're taking a short break, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. You can also find us on the Tabletop Bellhop Discord at discord.tabletopbellhop.com, where you can keep Sean company while he recovers from his surgery. Well, that's all for us tonight. If you enjoy our content, leave us a holiday gift in the form of a like, thumbs up, or better yet, a review on your podcatcher of choice. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.